During two spells at Brentford over three decades, Marcus Gale made nearly 200 appearances and scored 27 goals for the club. My first experience at any professional football club was here at Brentford at age 14. Signed schoolboy forms, which for my mum was like, what is this? It's like a contract or something. I was like, no mum, it's just a bit of paper to say I'm allowed to play for Brentford uh, for, for those schoolboy years. Um, I was able to still play Sunday league football for my team and then play, play for Brentford under 15s as well. So that was a good, good sort of in, introduction until I left school. And then I earned myself a two-year, what they called YTS, Youth Training Scheme. Um, and I left school just donkey blinkered about my dream, which was to play out here um, to the detriment of my education, because I didn't even go back for my results. So even today, I still don't even know how good or bad I've done. Because um, I was just so donkey blinkered into becoming a professional football, which was my ultimate dream. So I put myself under a lot of pressure. To, to succeed because I didn't have a backup plan. I had to make football. Terry Evans was a big character as well, especially at the back. Formidable, you can sense the opposition feared him when it was a, a set play or something because he was a goal scoring centre half. Um, it, sometimes it took two players to try and stop him and even then it, was, it wasn't enough. Keith Millen, again, Chris Hewton was a big influence um, playing left back at times um, behind me just guiding me and, and supporting me in certain ways. He never was one to overlap, but he would kind of just say, look, I'll defend, you do that half an attack. And he would just guide me through some positional stuff, which for the first time, that, that, was, that was it. That was, I've never been spoken to like that and sort of been guided in a, in a positional sense. So it was a massive help. After missing out on promotion the previous season, Gale was part of Brentford's 1991-92 third division title winning side. I remember the scenes here at the club, everyone was back at the club. I even called a couple of my mates and said, hey, there's something going on at Brentford tonight, you better get yourself down here. So my two best mates turned up, we were partying away like mad with everybody else. Um, it was good scenes um, and it was a sense of, you know what, football's a good, a good industry, you know, there's, there's some success in it. A learning curve, especially at that age, I think I was about 20, 21. Um, and it helped set up the rest of my career with those sort of experiences. Just missing out the year before and then achieving it the following year. Um, you need some highs and lows to get through this. There wasn't, I don't think there was too much communication. It wasn't like a farewell and a celebration or anything. It was just like, just the deal that happens. Um, there was no sort of goodbyes or anything like that. Or it was just, it happened that quick. And me coming back at that age, I think I was what, 33, 34, it was a good time because I've now come back as a, a man, come back as a father, a husband, a more settled individual, more thoughtful, a lot more knowledge within me. So I saw my role coming back was to help the budding youngsters that were in and around the team. Young Kevin was in that, that team, the old Jay Tab. Um, Hutchinson was in there, Eddie Hutchinson. So there's a lot of good youngsters around. Carl Osborne and, and Darius Charles, they was in the youth team, um, carving out their career. So my role was to like help the, help and support those sort of players. If they ask questions, I'll be there to like navigate that. Probably my impact was more off the field than on it. Your body has to change, but your brain doesn't stop developing. And I, I thought I used that more, obviously, in the second phase than I did in my first phase. There was such a warmth of reception from the fans when I came back. That stood out more than when I left <laughs> in the first place. And that, that's, that kind of gelled me once again with everybody here is that I saw the fans that saw me from 14, 15, 16, um, all the way to 23, move on, come back, and they're still here. I'm still fondly remembered by them. Um, and that helped me integrate again with with the club and the fans, which is important. Despite having enjoyed a successful 20 year playing career, Gail admits he was often the subject of racist remarks. It was tough going at times. The first time I ever noticed it, I think we played Bolton away at the old stadium. Went out and warmed up, then we started hearing noises. <laughs> I was like, hmm, that doesn't sound too friendly. Um, we've gone back in. We're probably frowning at what we've heard or whatever. We can't clearly make up, but you know that they don't like us. For whatever, they don't like us. And then the manager, he knew what was going on. He sent us straight back out. 
And I looked at him like, are you sure? You know what they're saying back there, or down there? But I think in, in a way, he was trying to harden us to have a career, rightfully or wrongfully, to get used to that. So I took it in on myself to think, you know what, I'm going to turn their booze into like, they're going to respect me somehow. The only way they're going to respect me is by being a very good player in all the years to come. You're kind of born into professional football in this sort of atmosphere and you've got nothing to sort of gauge it against apart from where I came from, which was down the road in Shepherd's Bush. Um, so I could have a reference of what's sort of acceptable, what was labelled at, people that looked like me. But there was that banter, we call it banter today. That was the changing room banter. And to be fair, I accepted it at the time. I accepted, well, that must be part of the professional world. What did, where else would I get my knowledge from in football? Um, back then there was no education in terms of um, what's the right things to say and do around, around football. Um, could I report it to anyone? Who, who, who's going to believe me? So you'd have to internalise that. Today it's a, it's, a, it's a minefield of things. So we've got things in place that safeguard young people in the game. Um, there's languages and phrases that you cannot use within the game. We don't see certain programmes like we did in the 80s on TV now because it causes offence. Now there's more education, there's more awareness. And that's my, my life now, um, doing the educational talks with Kick It Out up and down the country. And the work I do, I say like, hey, we fight it by educating players. There's a lot of work to be done. I encourage all clubs to, to get in touch and and put themselves in a position to help safeguard their youngsters because it's easily done. You can be targeted with one thing and it will stick. It, it's possibly, it could stick. Um, and I think we have to try and prevent that. You can only prevent that with knowledge and education.